So we've been looking at pop art, and I've started to drift towards more recent art that is in some sense within the same tendency of, of, of pop art, that is engagement with mass reproduced imagery, the world of consumer culture. There's a vast amount of such art, actually. You know, part of the problem of trying to do a course on recent art is that there are just so many artists in the world today compared to any other time period. You know, you could do a course on Renaissance art and you can feel pretty comfortable that you've covered all the main artists working at that time. Uh, but it's nothing like uh, the same that can be done in relation to contemporary art. There are so many artists that you just can't get a sense of... Um, I can't even mention the work of all the worthwhile artists that are, uh, have worked over the last uh, half century, you know. So what I'm doing is just picking up certain examples. Hopefully this will serve as a kind of um, you know, a, a schematic map with a few signposts or landmarks on it that you can then use to understand for yourself, navigate for yourself this field. Always we're more concerned with trying to develop your conceptual and visual skills so that then you can go and find uh, for yourself your way around the territory, even looking at art that hasn't even been made at the time when you were a student anyway. So the idea of giving a complete map uh, of recent art is, is a kind of false promise anyway, given that there will be new, new things on the map. You know, every, every day there are new things on the map. So along that way of thinking, looking here at some artists at the moment for, from the basically come to uh, fame in the, the 1980s and one of the most famous of them is Jeff Koons. This is perhaps his most famous work, in fact, Rabbit of 1986. So sometimes this is referred to as appropriationism. You know, I, I generally am not too fond of the value of style labels in explaining things. Uh, pop itself is just some term that is put together by, by journalists really to try and put together artists who, who seem to be similar in some way but actually may have slight differences in what they're trying to do. So appropriationism. A return of some of the pop concern with consumer culture, mass reproduced images and objects and also something of the you know the flavor of Dada you could say uh, Dada had uh, f been one of the things feeding into pop. Uh, Duchamp had been living in, in New York and, you know, like Jasper Johns uh, making bronze versions of beer cans. That's a kind of du Duchamp-like gesture at the very beginning moments of, of pop. So this is, uh, that tendency still alive again. Um, in a way, it's almost this work a kind of reverse of the Klaus Oldenburg sculptures of making soft sculptures of hard things. This is making a hard sculpture of a soft thing, a stainless steel sculpture of uh, a child's blow up toy rabbit, plastic kind of balloon like structure. If something ephemeral is turned into something lasting, stainless steel, well, it doesn't even rust, you know, it's very um, long-lived material. But it's a metal that doesn't have particularly strong art associations, unlike bronze, you know. It's not a kind of normally thought of as an art material, so it, fe it feels like a quotation of a of a non-art material into the world of art in that sense. Getting technicians, artisans, to make your art, which has become a, a really a very big, big trend to the present day. Um, that's something that uh, Kuhn, Kuhn's is involved with. He didn't fabricate it himself. There's, you know, great technical skill 
involved. So soft and hard, cheap and expensive, expensive, ephemeral and lasting, art and life, high and culture, low culture, all these things put together. So that's, that's a theme that we saw very much there with, with pop art, that kind of doubleness. Another early work by him, actually a year earlier, One Ball Total Equilibrium Tank. It's just a basketball suspended in a medium inside a tank. Well, the, a glass case, it's associated sometimes with these vitrines with museum displays, but uh, also with um, the world of commerce with consumer goods, you know, you, you are putting products on display to give some kind of aura or glamour to them. Um, it's some kind of special, special edition basketball. It's a brand new product. It's not something that's been used that has the trace of its owner. Uh, it it's, has that kind of virginity, you might want to say, a kind of purity of an un unused, the seductive quality of, a, of, of an object that you see on display in, 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 uh, for purchase in, in some kind of shop. So, you know, it's about the aura of consumer culture which drives so much of our society, with so, so much of what economic life in an art world is driven by you know the, the the desire to purchase things, or you know to to have a job so you can get money, so you can purchase those things that actually probably you don't really need, or the need is something manufactured by capitalist society, if you want to put it that way. To to, to you know, it's all part of the, the the world we live in, and somehow Kuhn's is is kind of both participating in that and also holding it up to review. A little bit like Andy Warhol in that respect, you know, Andy Warhol kind of plays with the aura of the artist, but at the same time is somehow, he uses it, but he's also sort of damaging it at the same, same time. Uh, Kuhn says, um, I believe that artists should use all the tools available to them today, all those that the so-called real world advertising the record of movie industries has made available to them. These are our competitors. If the art world doesn't employ all the seductive means at our disposal, it will be devoured by advertising in the entertainment industry. So, you know, we have to kind of live in the world of mass culture and consumerism and art has to kind of operate within that. And Kuhn's has done so very successfully, you can say. So is he part of the problem or part of the solution? You know, it's sometimes a little bit hard to, to say, but the ambivalence is itself perhaps interesting to some extent. Well, these sort of large works is, is very typical of works produced in for biennales and other such large exhibitions nowadays. Puppy, 1992. Well, again, it's, you know, a quotation of some sort of kitsch, childlike object. That's another binary, if you like, with the, the rabbit, is that it's a, a child's object in an adult, presented in an adult's world. Same, same here. It's a sculpture made with living flowers. That's all been done before. Ev almost everything has been done before. You know, Rauschenberg made paintings which grow. If you buy, bought one, you had to be responsible to water it. So changing scale, changing material helps you to kind of specify that emotion and, and 
stand outside it to, uh, to some extent. Yeah, art, art in a world where, you know, it, yeah, art can be marketed the same way as other kind of products nowadays, or there's even the phenomenon of artists not just having dealers, but having agents, you know, it's almost like a, like a, a movie star or something like that would have an agent. Sherry Levine. Well, we, when we're looking at, say, Roy Lichtenstein, we saw uh, a pop artist making images after other, other images, could be after uh, mass imagery, or it could be after high art imagery. Uh, so the same thing with Sherry Levine, who we've met already. We met her because when we were looking at abstract art, because she actually produces some works which are, are more like a kind of abstract vein. But again, they're a kind of close copy of an existing artist's work. Here she's just recopying uh, a Walker Evans photo in a very deadpan way. It's almost like a sort of direct copyright infringement. Taking a male artist's work and presenting it as a female artist, kind of appropriating an image. Or even she does this with Duchamp, taking perhaps his most famous work, this fountain, except she's got a kind of like gold plated version of it. Art about art. You know, it, it, if Duchamp is about bringing life or everyday objects into the art world, but this, then it's already an artwork when she engages with it. So it's more art about art. Because we do get this kind of thing in the real world as well. You know, you can go to some luxurious hotel room where they have gold plated toilet seats and all that kind of rubbish or, you know, that sort of thing is uh, some rich people go in for that kind of thing. Heim Steinbach, Charm of Tradition, 1985. So uh, he's also of this sort of appropriationist artist generation, but he's not become as famous as, as Jeff Koons. But similar idea of kind of brand new products, some uh, more seductive than others. In the kind of 1980s value system, trainers were starting to become very, uh, you know, sought after commodities, you know, where all the kind of special editions and so forth. Uh, this lamp, on the other hand, has a slightly kind of tacky, old, out of date, kitschy kind of feel about it. Um, putting the two together is it, it creates some kind of strange mood, but it, it looks almost like a, a bit like a sort of something you might see in a minimalist sculpture but then with objects added onto it, consumer objects. Uh, it's uh, are engaging with consumer display modes, you could say. You know, we, we are subjected all day long. If you are in, um, in town, in uh, downtown, you'll come across all the time kind of dis displays of commodities addressed at you. So it's a major feature of our contemporary life. Something that someone in the 17th century may not really recognize at all. Cindy Sherman. Yeah, we see how our pop artists engage with different kinds of uh, mass media imagery and the particular kind that she has been interested in, uh, especially in her early work, is uh, film or particularly the film still. So this one's called Untitled Film Still 1978 and I think you, you're probably familiar with her practice as one where she, she has puts herself in her own 
photographic works which mimic the look of different kinds of um, filmic uh, images. So deconstructing the, uh, the language of film and I suppose particularly a kind of feminist perspective, uh, the way film treats woman as the passive object of the male gaze, as, as, as just the subject of, of film rather than the, um, uh, I mean the object of film you could say, rather than the active subject. So if woman is always that which is represented, objectified, well one way is to play with that objectification, uh, yeah, making herself the subject of her, her own imagery, but in a way where she can conduct a masquerade, can play, play with roles, rather than just be, um, you know, therefore exposing that process. So this slightly uncanny lack of lack of fit with our expectations. It's a little bit, bit like the, the kind of role that um, we see in women playing in some of the Roy Lichtenstein images. You know, woman as kind of always passive, always waiting for the man to, to ring her. She can't do anything until he's rung her. She's not an active partner, you know, in, the, in, in whatever relationship this is meant to be. Of course, it's, it's just a single still. We get the sense of a fragmented narrative. We don't know the whole story. But the same is true with Roy Lichtenstein's, um, you know, single uh, frame from a from a comic book. This is all a different era to our era, an era where there were no mobile phones, <laughs> where you know if you wanted a phone call you had to wait by a phone <laughs> for that call to come. It's uh, almost hard for us to remember such a world. Isn't it terrifying that like so soon there will be kids who never, who don't even understand that concept, who just like yeah. Won't even be able to such yeah. A yeah. It's 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 very strange. Like you know, like uh, a, a technology that's kind of dead now is the fax machine. Actually, we do have one in our department office. But I can remember when there was only one fax machine in the whole university. You know, if you wanted to send a fax, you had to to go up to the registry. <laughs> you know, it was such a new new thing. So there's that kind of immense sort of obsolescence of, of, of technology that we have to deal with. It's a, it presents certain problems for artists, how, how, to, how to deal with that, both at the level of subject, but also at the level of, are you going to use that technology? Of course, it offers immense opportunities if you do, but obsolescence uh, will apply to you, you know, in a way that a Chinese ink and brush on paper is, you know, if you, even if it's a, a thousand years old, it could look just, the, uh, just as, as, as if you made it yesterday. It may have, uh, may feel old in terms of style perhaps, but um, not in terms of technique. But uh, art using new media that was made 10 years ago could look really kind of old fashioned at the level of technique. Actually, the is, is something made a thousand years ago sh shouldn't really, to us art historians, look old-fashioned in terms of style either. We shouldn't be prejudiced against things coming from another time or another place. We should just accept it on its own terms. At a certain point, she she starts to produce these much more fabricated images. Um, kind of, uh, it's like a kind of horror movie genre feel, special effects kind of um, works, and less less focused on her own features, which had you know had reappeared so many times in her images up to that point. It, it, she doesn't uh, uh, she does come back to using her own. 
features in, in, in later works, but there is this phase where uh, she moves a bit, little bit beyond that. Um, this is the Japanese artist Morimura and uh, his double nage, Marcel, 1988. It's a little bit like what Cindy Sherman is doing, but um, whereas she's masquerading as a woman, she's a woman masquerading as a woman, he's uh, playing with gender as well, um, uh, masquerading across gender and maybe across culture too. That's also something that you could say is going on. He's, he, as a Japanese artist, is sort of taking on, uh, um, repeating an image by Marcel Duchamp, which was itself a kind of play with identity. So another Japanese artist who, who likes to do that kind of identity play in a way is um, Riko Mori. Uh, she, she's from the Mori family that owns the, the Mori Art Gallery and, 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 and the, the company behind that. Uh, play With Me, 1994. So she's, she's sort of like masquerading as a kind of character from a comic book appearing in real life. Oh, yeah, it's a kind of variation on Roy Lichtenstein's theme in a way of concern with comic books. Of course, Japanese culture has its own very specific um, comic book culture. So outside of the video arcade, it looks like, you know, the kind of, kind of environment where people are obsessed with games that, um, that feature such characters, maybe, that kind of thing ambiguity between art and life. Same kind of idea with Jenny Holzer, Times Square Spectracolor board 1982. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fairly old technology in a way for putting texts into public space. Uh, maybe, you know, you could see them in the center of London or you know Piccadilly Circus or in Times Square in New York you know you maybe there be some n news can be put up on this sort of screen of m moving uh, moving words now of course we have much more up-to-date digital technologies but doing pretty much the same thing but I guess that the, the main thing is about trying to put your art into an everyday environment in such a way that it's it's kind of not even clear to most people looking at it that it is art. Um, in a way we had this when when you were talking about Lin Yi Lin's uh, work uh, on on Friday you know when we see the video of it in a in a exhibition we know we're looking at art but when people saw it happening in the street originally the actual performance maybe a lot of people had not really any idea what kind of activity that was uh, maybe they never even heard of art that art could be like that anyway you know so that kind of blurring of categories of course she does things in art settings too often that these these artists who engage with public space like that they, they have this sort of double life um, even if they don't don't work in galleries as well and most of them do then at least the the documentation of the art they make in public will come back into galleries this is a very interesting space of the Guggenheim Museum in New York there's a spiral ramp that is always a challenge to artists it's a building that doesn't want to just be a, a kind of passive white cube background to art artists always have to or the curators have to find ways of dealing with that ramp space the use of just the use of text which is something quite important for Jenny Holzer is you could say a kind of feminist strategy it's another approach to how do you 
escape the the way the gaze is often a kind of a, a male gaze and um, women have so often been the subject of art and not the, the, the empowered um, you know they've been objectified by art uh, well moving towards texts escaping from images that's that's a kind of strategy of iconoclasm which certain feminist artists have, have adopted Jenny Holzer Barbara Kruger would be another one I sorry I don't have one of hers to show you today but um, you know that's just one possible strategy Bruce Nauman the true artist helps the world by revealing mystic truths 1967 yeah like so many more contemporary artists he works in several different idioms at the same time often so he produces these uh, neon works that's one thing he also does kind of video works and, and, and uh, one of the first artists really to, to use the video camera. Whole, yeah, range of different things. So, yeah, neon light. Again, it's something that's at the very end of its life as a, as a kind of form. It's a very modern form, but now being replaced by its digital, you know, LED equivalents and so forth. In Hong Kong, there was this immense culture of it of neon sign in advertising um, the M plus uh, museum uh, in embryo um, not yet opened has done a project an online project about neon in Hong Kong uh, they documented many of the big neon signs and they also got artists to, to do engagements with them uh, so here is, you know, yeah, one of the first artists who, who wants to try and play somehow with, with neon, and it, he's got this kind of again using words, I suppose he's got this kind of portentous sounding truth, a uh, claim about the importance of art, but there's this kind of high low quality about the whole thing. Using a medium, more often used for for trivial commercial. Nam Jun Pei, Korean artist who's really a great pioneer of, of video art. This is his video Buddha of 1988. There are several different artworks where he kind of basically uses the same idea. Uh, can't quite make it out here, but the idea is that uh, there's a video camera recording the Buddha and pre presenting the Buddha's head and presenting it um, on the screen. So there's a sense of a, a, a something looking at the, the, the image of that thing. A lot of the early use of video cameras um, the interest is in the video's ability to um, a sort of close circuit use, uh, live use of video rather than recording to some some videotape, uh, because that's the thing that's so different from from film. You know, film recorded uh, motion, motion it's a time-based medium, and it did it much better than early video did. Early video is pretty low low grade resolution you know so it can't compare most of the time to to film um, it's the accessibility of video this is around from about 1965 onwards you get the Sony Porter pack suddenly you can move around with a video camera characteristically a film film camera is a much more cumbersome object can only move in a, in a, in a very restricted way. Even there you get blurring like the Hong Kong cinematographer Chris Doyle when he's working on Wong Kar Wai 
movies he, he has handheld camera use a lot but that's the world of film being influenced by the world of video you could say but especially the, the use of, of closed circuit you know live real-time video is, is an interest of artists and very little editing goes on because editing was a very difficult thing to do in video in those early days now it's a much simpler thing when you can use software packages with digital vi video they easily edit things but a lot of early video art you don't see that much editing another uh, pioneer of, of video art um, Gary Hill in as much as it is always already taking place 1990 like the Nanjun Pei piece, you can say, you know, he, he makes the actual monitor, in Pei's case, the TV, it's a TV, um, part of what is, part of what you're looking at, you know, it becomes an object within a kind of in installation. Um, for a lot of video art, somehow the, the, the monitor is something you, you don't want to pay attention to. And it's sometimes a problem, how do you kind of de-emphasize the fact that there is a monitor? The monitor is just like the frame in a painting, it's not the artwork itself. But for Gary Hill and for Nam Jun Paik, uh, they, they actually sort of incorporate the, ob the, the monitor as a thing itself. Often in Andrew Paik's work, you'll see these kind of very archaic, old-fashioned kind of TV, TV screens and things like that, where he's deliberately kind of foregrounding uh, the object itself. So TV, during this whole post-war period, becomes central to, the, to, to people's lives. You know, the, the, uh, the third parent, sometimes people call it, you know, it's so important for how, how children growing up spend so many hours of their day in front of the TV. Again, this is something slightly changing in our era, what the role of the TV is being displaced maybe by a, the computer screen, you know, people are looking at their computer screens, you know, even while they're doing all sorts of other activities. But uh, before that era, it was the era of the TV, and still it's very important in, in many ways. So uh, it's not surprising if artists want to engage with it as, as uh, part of modern culture. And video becomes a particularly useful way of engaging, not just as a kind of way of critiquing film, well, that's one role it plays, but also of critiquing television. So Gary Hill, what he's got here uh, are images of his own body, naked body, but uh, each of the individual images, you only see uh, one fragment of it. You're never uh, getting a sense of the body as a totality. And of course he's playing with scale, different images are of different scale. And the length, each, uh, they're not static images, they're moving images, but the loop, and they're, and they're looped, you know, but the loop, length of the loop varies. So some loops are only like five seconds long, others maybe half a minute or something like that. The really most famous artist using video is Bill Viola. Just showing you one of his works, the Nance, Nance Triptych of 1992. Often he's using very high definition video, you know, state of the art video, whereas some video artists like to play with the very low tech, low resolution sense of video. He tends to go the other way altogether. It's a very state-of-the-art screens he's using when he's using a screen rather than a projection. So, so monitors or 
projection. Of course, are the two basic ways to present video as art. So this is a triptych, as the the title tells you, a three-part image. And we think of triptych, uh, we think of uh, altar pieces that open up, uh, and then you see three panels as a kind of that's what we originally think of triptychs as being. And that's not unusual because a lot of his work is referential on art history, referential on painting. Uh, like there's a work he produced called uh, The Meeting, and the, sorry, The Greeting, 1995, which is like a slow motion animated Renaissance painting. Actually, slow motion is a kind of uh, a common tactic that he uses in his work. What we have here is an um, image of a, a baby being born, video uh, loop about that, and uh, an image of um, someone on the verge of death. And it, it relates to the, uh, the time of his, his own becoming a parent and his own mother dying. Then in between is a, a slightly more dreamlike image uh, of someone sort of floating underwater. Often water or fire, they're things that often appear in his art, especially water. So the two, the beginnings and end of life, things that are normally taboo, in, we'd, we're not normally able to, 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 to see that hidden from from us perhaps as modern people especially you know maybe in earlier centuries and even today in some cultures birth and death is not so quite hidden away taboo but for us it is so a kind of cosmic perspective on human life often there's that sort of mystical quality in his works, often people are going through some kind of transition, like coming in or out of water, something like that. There you go, just to, to give you some sense. It's so difficult to present video art uh, without taking up a lot of time, you know, in a, in a classroom. So just showing you two stills from one video. Chitty and Waring. 60 minutes silence, 1996. A group of, they're actors, but they're dressed up as if they're British policemen and women. Originally she wanted to have actual policemen, but it's difficult to get enough of them together because of the, the sh working in shifts and so forth. And it's just a single take, no editing, a static camera for 60 minutes. You know, we expect in a movie for there to be action, but this is a sort of still life of uh, people just standing there or sitting there, as the case may be, staring out at you. Of course, it, the gaze of a, of, of, of a, a policeman, policewoman at you is different from the gaze of just some any old person. Maybe you start to feel a bit guilty or something like that. I mean, what are the, what is your, you know, certain associations come up. Your normal power as being the person looking at the image is slightly tested because the, the image is looking back at you, especially since it's a large scale uh, image. And I think you're, you're sort of aware that they're, they're probably not actually policemen. You know, there's a slight, slight sense of discrepancy. So it's a little bit like the Cindy Sherman work in a way. It kind of undermines authority, but at the same time, play, you know, playing with it. Uh, 
I decided, you know, again, it's to do with this difficulty of presenting video art in a in a classroom setting. Uh, I decided to give you this uh, this fragment from one of her other videos. This is a, the, the the text, um, and this is as the title says, "Confess all on video. Don't worry, you'll be in disguise in tree." So it's, it, she, she put a, like a, a small ad in a newspaper, asked for people to come forward and wearing disguises when she videoed them, then they tell, they confess things that they've done. Of course, some of the things people confess uh, in, in that video sound made up, you know, that's, that's liable to happen if, if you do something like this. But that's all part of what it's all, all about, you know. It's um, like confession is supposed to be private, but then here is confession made, made public in a way. And I, and I think one thing you get is the sort of the banality of it. A lot of people are just, you know, cheating on their girlfriends, boyfriends, that sort of thing. It's all kind of normal. The normal kind of stuff that you'd expect. Mark Wallinger. I don't know for some reason I've picked mostly British examples at this point. This is Wallinger's Angel of 1997. So there's this rather strange character, he's playing it him, himself wearing dark glasses, got a stick, almost like a blind person, but blind people are sometimes a, a, a associated with having uh, inner insights, spiritual insights. So uh, he's standing there and he's reciting something from the Bible. And then at the end of the video, he goes up the escalator behind, backwards. Meanwhile, you have these people uh, on the escalators going up and down in the center. Uh, on, on, sorry, on either side. And um, what he's actually done, he's he's recorded it. He's playing it back back to front. So he actually came down the escalator and then had a text that he he read back to front. Uh, and then when you play it backwards, it sounds like th that it makes sense. Uh, that's something Gary Hill did as well in an earlier video. He has a video called Why Do Things Get in a Muddle? Where he's speaking a text backwards and then playing the video backwards. So every, almost everything seems to make sense in the video uh, because we follow what what is being said, but the pronunciation is slightly kind of weird. and We don't quite know why. And then a few things start to be odd, like smoke going into a pipe and th things like that. To give you a couple of ho Hong Kong examples from the work of Ellen Powell. She's probably the, the, the most uh, pioneering figure in Hong Kong video art, set up the Videotage uh, New Media Collective. Um, this is a work that she showed in the Venice Biennale, the first time Hong Kong was represented in the Venice Biennale. This is Recycling Cinema, 2000. Uh, she, she recorded from a rooftop of uh, traffic going on an elevated highway by the harbour and the, the camera moved backwards and forwards so sometimes the camera is moving in the same direction as the traffic, sometimes it's not. Traffic is going in both directions. So most of the traffic is blurred and out of focus, except occasionally something comes into focus because it's got traveling the same speed as the video camera. And then ha how it was actually, pres there is a sort of what they call a single channel version where you can just project this, the result of that on a screen. But in Venice, what she did was to have the projection moving along a long screen backwards and forwards. So there's two level of movement. There's the movement of the projection and the movement of the camera when it was filming, plus the movement of the objects being filmed. And 
actually a lot of her videos are about film in some way or another. So, so for example, you you know the title "Recycling Cinema" kind of implies that, uh, and she made well, she made at least one film uh, video using film from uh, a, a government kind of documentary film unit and things like that. This Song of the Goddess is about um, a couple of. Uh, Chinese opera um, actresses and they, they played male and female role, roles so she's sort of looking at their their relationship by holding it up to scrutiny by replaying their, uh, their those scenes they were in a relationship themselves so she's kind of making visible their relationship and she's also interspersing it with some of her own uh, personal imagery because uh, she, uh, she's she's lesbian and she wants to in a kind of fairly subtle way kind of deal with those kind of issues but not in um, not quite in as overt a way as maybe some uh, western artists might like to do that it's more a kind of implicit way This is one of the very first works of what you might want to call digital art. This is Geoffrey Shaw's The Legible City from 1989 to 91. Um, interactive digital artwork. What, happen what you do, you sit on the bike and you pedal and you get a choice of um, which city you want to pedal around. You choose, I think, from about five cities, I think. One is New York, one is Amsterdam. And then once you've chosen your city by pressing a button, whatever, then on the screen in front of you will appear the roads of that city in a very schematic way. They, the, the sides of the road are defined by words that are written, written there. You see these big block letters. And then you, you can just cycle around the map of whatever city you've chosen. It's kind of a virtual reality thing, although it's not a kind of immersive environment. It's just there in front of you. And at that point in time, it was made. This would be very much that the you know, massive amount of computing power is needed to produce something like that. Now it would be very easy to do, I suppose. And you know, one could imagine all kinds of video games that have much more complex, immersive environments that you can be an actor in. Uh, but at that point in time, this was kind of at the growing edge of things. Now, Geoffrey Shaw, until recently, he, wa he was in Hong Kong as the head of the School of Creative Media in City University. So he, 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 he'd been working here a lot. Again, fascinated by uh, cutting edge technology. So he was very much involved with um, some of those digital displays you get in art exhibitions that animate paintings in different ways. Like I know he, he was involved with the project of kind of animating uh, some of the images from the Don Huang caves. So viewers can, can explore. Okay, let, let's have our break there. I think that's, that's uh, enough for now. And then we'll come back and look at the minimalism, the next um, tendency I want to, to look at in, in recent art.